Well, hello, and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor. Thanks very much for tuning in to episode 32 here in the frozen tundra that is Canada in the middle of February or getting closer to the end of February. Appreciate you taking the time to join me. Uh, I spent a couple of shows, obviously, wandering the car show circuit. Hopefully you enjoyed the last couple of episodes from the Canadian International Auto Show. It was a really good EV presence, and I was uh, fortunate to get some decent interviews from people and just to get a snippet of what's going on in the EV landscape. Uh, I got a few comments before I get into some of the stories. got a few comments from people saying, hey, how come you didn't show any Teslas or go to Tesla? Well, there wasn't anything new from Tesla, to be quite honest, so there wasn't really a, a reason to go and film them and ask them any questions and, and do anything because uh, there's nothing different uh, at this point from them other than the S, the X, and the Model 3, which are all shipping cars. So uh, uh, as they come out with new stuff, I'll certainly be checking them out. Uh, I wanted to kind of focus on some of the newer models and refresh and updates that were going on with some of the EVs. And um, I was pretty confident and uh, that there is efforts in the EV landscape going on more so here in Canada than maybe other parts of the globe. Uh, it better, of course, in Europe and other places. So uh, thanks very much for the comments that I received from that show. And let me get into a few stories that I'm following for today. So first one, I'm just tracking the EV federal tax credit. Uh, obviously something that's very important to a lot of my U.S. viewers and people that are down there that are still thinking about getting into an electric vehicle and thinking about how the tax uh, credit or benefit can help them in an EV purchase situation. Now, if you don't know already, Tesla and GM have both reached the limit of the 200,000 plug-in electric car sales. They reached that a little while ago. So that's triggered, of course, the phase out of the tax credit by them. And if you see the chart behind me, that'll explain how that works. So Tesla and GM are in now into their um, uh, Q, let's see, we're into Q1. So they're at the two quarters with the 50% amount left, if you can see that in the orange color. So if you were to apply uh, for a federal tax credit today for a new GM or Tesla EV purchase or a plug-in vehicle purchase, um, it, you will only be applicable to get up to $3,750, not the full $7,500. And then that'll drop to $1,875 in, uh, in July 1st of this year and, run, and carry on for Tesla. And then for GM, it'll drop uh, October uh, first of this year for Q4. These are calendar quarters that are marked here, and that will happen for GM. And then it'll drop to 1875 and then be phased out for both of them in 2020. With Tesla, basically, from a Tesla perspective, you will not be able to get a US federal tax rebate or credit after the end of this calendar year. By the looks of this chart, GM will go into the first quarter of next year to still uh, be eligible to receive a tax rebate. As you can see on the chart, the other manufacturers that are still have lots of room for, for, for uh, claiming the full tax rebate tax credit are Nissan, Ford, Toyota, and BMW. I mean, Toyota hasn't done much, but I mean, plug-in, they have some plug-in, so they're still selling that. And of course, BMW there. So that kind of gives you an idea. So none of those guys are going to be impacted over the next little while. Um, and um, hopefully, you know, people can still take advantage. Now, this is not um, this is in addition to whatever other state incentives you may have in the U.S. or municipal or, or others. I mean, uh, I remember reading something about a hydro carrier that was providing some sort of an incentive if you got an EV or a charger. So there are still other incentives that may be more local to your pertinent area. So I would uh, uh, advise you to go check that out to, depending on where you live to see what's there. So good update on the federal tax credit. It still has lots of room for growth. And as new vendors come in, so as Rivian, as an example, when they arrive, they will be, if the tax credit's still in place, they'll be eligible for the full up to $7,500 and so forth, unless uh, things happen. And I know that there's been talk about changing the tax credit, but for right now, it's there and still working quite well. I mentioned on a previous show about some fast charging uh, expansions that's happening in Canada with the, uh, uh, with the Electrify Canada network but there's also another announcement that came out that is going to really help us canadians uh petro canada so they are our i guess our largest national um, gasoline or fuel petrol station provider in here in canada they have stations all over the place they have literally thousands of stations they've just announced that they've started to build out a network of dc fast chargers and it's going to be a coast-to-coast -coast coverage network as you can see by the map behind me they want to build it from halifax to nova scotia halifax through nova scotia 
uh, New Brunswick into uh, the other provinces and all the way out west to Vancouver. It looks like if you drew a line, if you follow that path, it's pretty similar to the Trans-Canada Highway route, which is excellent because that's actually where we need it. Most people doing those uh, uh, crossing Canada does do take the Trans-Canada Highway to do that. So it'd be great to have those. Now, I know that they've just opened one up here in the greater Toronto area on the west end in a town called Milton, Ontario. And I actually w went to visit that site a couple of days ago. Now, these charging stations are, are going to be a combination of Chatamo and CCS. 50 kilowatt, I believe, for now. I'm not sure of anything else, um, but the, they might be higher. And of course, Electrified Canada is going to continue its its, its construction of the 32 fast and ultra fast charging stations for uh, focusing on southern British Columbia, Ontario and Quebec markets for now. They both offer Chatabo and CCS and they vary power from 50 to 150 kilowatt and some of them are even going to come uh, with the ultra fast or ultra ultra fast or whatever you want to call it <laughs> charging of 350 kilowatts because that requires some liquid cooling cabling to prevent uh, anything blowing up on you i guess uh, and construction of these uh, first charging stations for the electrify canada are supposed to start at the end of uh, or around the second quarter of this year so within the next three or four, or four months or so if people uh, if you do come across an electrify canada um, charging station in these areas, uh, snap a picture and send it to me. I'd love to hear from you and uh, get a report on see what's actually moving out. But it's good that Petro Canada is jumping into the game as well. Quick update from Tesla. Uh, Elon was on a uh, podcast show the other day uh, through some uh, investors that uh, uh, I guess get him in a room every once in a while and ask him a bunch of questions. And really the focus was on self-driving. And Elon actually has come out and said that um, he thinks that Tesla will achieve technically full self-driving by the end of this year, by the end of this calendar year. Um, he he means that the car will be, you know, in a situation will be able to find you in a parking lot, come pick you up and take you all the way to the, to your destination without an intervention, without you actually having to drive for, uh, for with, with the technology and the enhancements that they're coming out with and furthering. Um, it, now, it doesn't mean that it works with 100% certainty. Nobody's going to guarantee that, of course, from a liability aspect. And But it does really require uh, um, no observation perfectly so you do have to still watch what's going on you know even with driver assistant technologies today I've, uh, as I've explained before you do need to sit behind the wheel you do need to have your hands on the wheel and be able to take control at a, at a moment's notice so we're not 100% there yet with that technology but Elon is insinuating and referencing that they are really really close so you know he's talking about level 4 autonomy not really true level 5 at this point because level 5 means that the that really the human driver we can get in the car and do nothing just go to sleep in the back seat it's your you know johnny cab and i reference that quite a lot over the last few years situation if you've seen the movie um total recall you'll get my reference to johnny cab the original not the remake and uh that goal is really a few years away and it's it's not a it, it's somewhat technical but it's also to do with legislative insurance regulatory factors how are you going to, how are laws going to be written, you know, around autonomous vehicles? And autonomous vehicles are only safe as the other cars on the road can be. So if you've got one autonomous vehicle and you're surrounded by 10 ICE, you know, other vehicles that are being driven by actual people, um, the people make mistakes. We don't think we drift off to sleep, whatever, change lanes without signaling, whatever. And autonomy can help mitigate some of these situations but it's not perfect either and you know humans are very unpredictable and that's why i'm not a, a firm believer in full autonomy because really in order for full autonomy to work everything has to be connected if if all the entire or the majority of vehicles are connected then that can create a safer zone or safer bubble around your vehicle because there's communication going on a lot faster than our human reactions can be and that would would generate a lot more um, benefits in full autonomy level five just wanted to make that known that it looks like elon's finally coming out with something now if you remember he said oh a while ago um, that they were going to drive a, a model three or some sort of maybe a model x across from la to new york or new york to la uh, in full autonomy mode uh, i haven't seen that happen so again guys I'm not bashing Tesla and I'm not bashing Elon. Elon, he's brilliant and I really believe in what they're doing. But when they make these timelines, you got to give them lots of leeway. Tesla seems to be behind the times a little bit on this and that's okay. It's better to do it right than kind of fat, get, get into it and make some mistakes because uh, these mistakes could be very critical. 
So keep watching on Tesla's project uh, process or progress. That's what I'm trying to say on uh, uh, driving autonomy. Now, sticking with Tesla, this little story kind of popped up the last couple of days that it was interesting. You know, and again, folks, I love Tesla. People, I get accused all the time of, of you know, only li liking Nissan and not promoting Tesla enough and whatever. Um, look, I like Tesla. You know, I had a reservation. I'm enamored by them, but they're not the only player in the game. And they cannot be for many reasons that I've talked about in other shows and through my comments. And, and if you don't know what those reasons are, then you need to go through, watch some shows and look through some of my comments on YouTube to get to understand where I'm coming from. But the Model 3 is doing very well. It's going to continue to do well, obviously. And there's a lot of pre-orders that still have to be filled. And there's a lot of new orders that are coming out, which is great for Tesla and to continue their positive cash flow momentum. Now, however, the Tesla Model 3 is not a perfect vehicle. And there's been some in and out information from consumer reports that, you know, yeah, they think it's it has the highest rating from a recommendation standpoint. And now they've come back and kind of just reviewed that to say, you know what? We're not 100% sure about that rating. We've actually downgraded it. And the main reason is, it's not because they're bashing Tesla. They're not bashing battery electric cars. They're not against anything. They look at all cars very, very much from the same viewpoint, right? Whether it's an ICE vehicle or a battery electric vehicle, they do look at it in the same methods. And they have a, a methodology and a testing type of program to be able to come out with their ratings. Love or hate consumer reports, that's up to you. Uh, but millions upon millions do read consumer reports. It's kind of like Gartner for the IT environment, which is where I, I, I play. Uh, my real job is in IT. And Gartner, whether you like Gartner or not, when they speak, people listen and people look at to them for advice. And consumer reports is very similar from a consumer product per, uh, a viewpoint. So they've come out and say that they no longer recommend the Model 3 um, from a, a high reliability uh, uh, scoring because, uh, and the scoring includes road tests and safety technology and crash, it's, it's a whole com combination of stuff and owner satisfaction ratings. Now I know that when I talk to owners, everybody loves a Tesla as they should, they're great cars. Um, however, what Consumer Reports have found out is that you know, part of their rating system is that they expect the cars to last and not be in the repair shop a, a lot. And that's why the reliability so, uh, uh, side to what they report on is very important um, because that's what really gives you, yeah, it can drive nice and it can accelerate fast and it can look pretty, but if it's in the shop a lot or having to do a lot of minor repairs or, or other things, the reliability could become suspect. So they've concluded that the Model 3 isn't scoring as high in the reliability as they initially thought it would, um, so that they are downgrading that to a little bit lower level of a recommendation. So it's not their top pick from a recommended uh, vehicle. Um, you know, they're saying, they're, they're obviously they've talked to a lot of owners and there's reports about loose body trim and glass defects and, and all these other little things that happen. I mean, I haven't heard anything major happen to a Model 3 that's come off the production line. Tesla's pretty solid when it comes to, to building. However, they are still a new, relatively new car company, ramping up awfully fast. Quality control, it continues to be something that they improve over and over and over as they build up more cars and as they train people and, and automate more and, and put new things to get cars out faster. And we know that if, if Tesla can fix something through software over the air updates, they do it pretty quick. But you can't fix a loose body panel or you can't fix a, a glass window that gets stuck halfway coming down or you can't fix a rattling noise in the back through a software update. These are things that you have to take it to the shop and get it fixed. And where Tesla shines is in their post-sale service experience, right? They will bend over backwards to fix your vehicle, give you a loaner. They'll even come to your driveway and fix a, something, you know, change your tires or whatever you need to be done as well. Uh, but I'm talking more about not routine service, but I'm talking about things that need to be fixed under warranty, something that's that's gone wrong with the car. And it's not a ton. It's not a lot, but it's enough for consumer reports to say, you know what, it should really be like this in a premium luxury car brand. Remember, Tesla is a premium luxury car brand. They are competing with BMW, Audi, Mercedes, and so on and so on. And, and you should expect the quality to be at those levels. And no car manufacturer is perfect. And yes, the Germans, as an example, have had 80, 90, 100 years of manufacturing know-how to really be able to build really tight, well-finished cars. And Tesla's had a dozen, not even a dozen years or so. So I get it. But I'm just trying to point out that it's not a perfect vehicle and that, in my opinion, 
owners shouldn't be having to go through those kind of things. I know, you know, people, I'm probably going to get hate mail now and saying, ah, you don't know. I mean, I know I talk to a lot of owners and they love their cars, but every owner that I've talked to for a Model 3 and, and even a Model X and others, they've had to take it to back to Tesla for something at least once, if not multiple times. So they've had to get things fixed. And I know that you owners are very patient and you're loving and because you're passionate about the brand and I get it. We're all like that. I'm just pointing out the fact. I'm not saying you shouldn't buy a Model 3. I'm not saying you shouldn't buy a Tesla. All I'm saying is that be aware that these things are still seem to be happening and Tesla is getting better and better as they go. But for a luxury brand, in my viewpoint, is that there's got to be a point in time where that doesn't happen anymore or it's such a small number that it's insignificant. Tesla has not got to that point yet from a quality control. They need to get there, though. If you're looking at sustainability in a company 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now as they grow, you can't keep going out and shipping vehicles that have to be brought back to the shop or have to be serviced for minor things. Um, some of them could be pretty major. You know, there was an article about something, uh, something major that happened to a car that he actually had to, you know, take it off the road, uh, because that costs money for Tesla as well. There's, there's time and effort and parts and materials and, you know, uh, that, that have to, and, and, and that all takes off the margin of the model three. So you sell a margin, uh, a model three for X, but it has to go back into the shop for minor adjustments for, you know, late after your two, three, four, five, six months down the road that your margin that you had is now chunked down a little bit, right? Because you've, you've had to out, you've had to pay employees, you've had to pay for parts or that you may not have needed before or, or work or outsource maybe body work or whatever, the painting, whatever the case may be, that costs money. There's money being paid somewhere. So it all chips away at that. And that's not sustainable for a really long run, folks. You're right. I talked to somebody yesterday that told me Tesla was dying. And I go, where are you hearing that from? They're making money. They're moving vehicles. They're growing. So the market, there's a lot of people that still look at Tesla as a dying company. I don't. But if they continue down that path of of not really sharpening up the quality control and just bringing out cars and, and you know, eventually that's going to come back to bite them because it does with other manufacturers. So that's all I wanted to talk about there. A little bit of a rant on that, but it's important for, for people to understand that because they don't, right? We don't always want to paint a rosy picture, right? You know, we've talked about other manufacturers and some of the shortcomings that they have. Not one manufacturer is perfect. There's going to be shortcomings with everybody. And that's why I do what I do so that people that are thinking about EVs have a, can make a more informed decision. So keep watching out for the, for the Model 3. I, I'm, I, I truly believe that they are continuing to improve their processes and refine their qualities and that they will get better because I do believe in Tesla. Switching gears just to some global numbers is an article that came out that still ranks the Nissan Leaf as the number one selling uh, globally battery electric vehicle on the planet today. It's the best selling with, uh, well, this article referenced 360,000 units. But uh, when I was at the car show recently, Nissan had talked about over 400,000 Leafs that are on the road. So I'll, I'll go with their numbers because they're probably a bit more accurate than that. What's interesting, if you look at these charts behind me, the first one here is referencing what um, was, uh, this is an accumulative total of model brands globally. So these are global sales numbers starting uh, to be tracked in 2014. Um, when they, at least what, the, what this chart shows, we knew, as an example, we know the Nissan Leaf came out in 2010, the Model S in 2012. So, you know, there are, these are numbers up to those points in time, but you can see the progression in the numbers for the Nissan Leaf um, up to about 400,000 uh, installs, at least into early 2019. But so that number could be slightly low, but we'll go with that. 363,000 with the Model S being the second from a global installation or deployment perspective of 243,000 and so forth. You can see China with BAIC and these guys that are coming out are just slamming, slamming building cars. So it's doing a lot of them. What I found interesting in this uh, chart was the Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid. I, I know it's done well in Canada over the last year, but I didn't really um, understand the significance of how well it's done worldwide. And, you know, it's just barely behind that Chinese brand, but at 172,000 from a global sales uh, uh, achievement, that's that's really, really good. So uh, my hat's off to Mitsubishi because it does fill a nice void. Chevrolet Volt being in there and then others, as you can see on the chart um, that I've highlighted. 
So those are total, and that's good. Um, if we look at um, global for a year by year, so how many sales were done last year in, in 2018, the Model 3 should be taking top spot within the next year or so from a total global sales as they now are delivering boatloads into Europe. Now they're, they're looking at uh, uh, delivering boatloads into China and other areas as they expand out. So the Model 3 uh, should quite easily take that top spot from Nissan as the overall global leader. But I just wanted to point that out. Just good to see the progression in those numbers and uh, that no matter what you want to say about a brand or a vehicle, uh, they still do well, they still sell, and there's a big market out there for all these manufacturers to continue to grow and to sell battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids. So let's uh, keep our eye on that. You heard me at the car shows talk to some people from uh, uh, from Kia, of course, and I didn't get an opportunity to talk to anybody from Hyundai when I was down in Toronto last week because the, they just weren't available. Uh, I guess I missed them on the timing, but I did talk about the Kona, and there's been lots of videos and stuff. And all I want to say about the this is that it, um, we're seeing now the supply, kind of to what I alluded to earlier, that you know all this pent up demand. So with, with shows like what I do and all the other YouTube shows and, and, you know, fully charged and all these other guys that are out there and advertising and all the other momentum around EVs and clubs and societies and, and legislation and everything, we've now got to a point where we're starting to really create some awareness, right? That's not one out of 10 people that you walk on down on the street. Do you know what an EV is? It's probably now four or five out of 10 people at least have some vague knowledge of an EV. They might think, yeah, isn't that a Model 3? Something like that. So it's much more prevalent than it was just a short couple of years ago. So now, you know, as what I'm trying to do with this show is to spur adoption. Well, obviously it's working with all, you know, all of our community efforts globally that things are happening, that people are now looking more into EVs and they're looking at things like uh, items like the Kona EV. Um, and they're because they're great vehicles. They they're getting to those sweet spots, and now you know more choice, more range, easier. Now people are going. You know what? It's much more convenient. More charging is happening. I'm seeing all this growth now. Now's a good time. So, you know, poor uh, Hyundai unfortunately is getting slammed with orders, and they're just not. They just don't have the capability to to produce enough. So they're they've come out and said that uh, because all their their EVs are produced in the uh, Ulsan Korea uh, factory, it's a one location right now. Um, that um, they really were going to just starting to focus deliveries on ZEV uh, states. We know, you know, that they have started making deliveries in the U.S. Um, and uh, the western and other northeastern regions of the U.S. market, and including Canada, parts uh, at least Ontario, Quebec, and B.C. and Canada. But they're saying, however, with the current demand now really accelerating. Uh, daily, they're getting more and more or pre-orders and people that are looking for it, that they're not able to support the volume sales in all non-ZEV states at this time. So they plan to offer the Kona co Electric in non-ZEV states that exhibit higher electric vehicle demand. So if you live in a non-ZEV state, but there's a really high demand for the Kona EV, they'll try to focus some deliveries there. If you live in a non-ZEV state, there isn't, they're going to bypass you for a while or not really send a lot of cars and go from there. But they're claiming right now, and there's another article that talked about European orders, that it's a six to 12 month wait for it. If you ordered it today, you might have to wait a year to receive that Kona EV. So that's how constrained they are. And I'm guessing because Kia and Hyundai share similar supply chains and, and factories and components, I'm guessing that the Kia... Uh, Nero EV is going to fall under the same situation from a constraint. I don't know about the Soul uh, yet, but I, I'm, I'm just guessing that the uh, Nero is going to fall into that. And I'm already hearing reports about six month delays now, and that's starting to grow. So it's not not going to be surprising if they come out and say it's going to be a year if you order the Kia Nero today EV. It'll be a year before you get it. That's just the that's the state of the market that we're in. We've got these manufacturers that have jumped in later than Tesla and Nissan and some others have. They're spooling up, they're getting in, and they've come into the market now where instead of the demand was this, the demand is now that. And they're going, oh, you know, we're just not there yet. We can't build them fast enough. We got all this other stuff we got to do. And yes, we were just building compliance. So we're, we're behind the eight ball. I know, I get it, you know. And now everybody, you know, VW, all these companies are pouring money into now spooling up to, to start producing really quality battery electric cars in, in more numbers than just compliance reasons. So give these guys a break. Uh, don't be bashing them. Don't say, ah, you know, Tesla shipping and now you guys are not. Hey, listen, 
people in Europe are still waiting for the Model 3. They're only now starting to get it almost three years later, folks. Three years. So don't be bashing Hyundai. Don't be bashing Kia. Don't be bashing VW for wait times when these things start happening because Tesla is still, you know, people are waiting. People in Australia and New Zealand have no timeline in sight for those guys right now for deliveries. So give companies a break. You know, um, it took minimum two years to get the Model 3 into the U.S. markets uh, in any type of capacities, two and a half to almost, again, years to get it up to Canada. So this is the nature of the business that we're in, and this is what's happening with car companies. It's a good problem to have. Again, we've got more excitement. We've got more uh, people are, are attenuate of the EV landscape. But these are the growing pains now. As we as you know, we fit that curve, these are the growing pains that we're going to suffer. It's going to take organizations a, a one or two years to really kind of build up and streamline this process to get to a point where they can start building 100,000, 150, 200,000 or more cars a year to start really fulfilling demands. So I'm glad to see that their sales are off the chart for both these organizations because that's a good sign. That means people are wanting to get into EV adoption. And so I don't see this as a negative. I see this as a typical business problem. I believe Rivian's going to have a similar issue when they start spooling up. They're going to have long wait times. I would not put that past them, even with Amazon's money. And who knows what else happens to them. So that's just the nature of the business. But uh, if, you, if you've got an order in for either the Enero or the Kona EV, let me know whether it's U.S. or Canada or Europe. Let me know what they're telling you because this is what I'm hearing from the media. But I'd like, always like to get a personal, uh, a personal viewpoint and feedback. So send me an email or drop me a comment if you've got uh, some information to share. And uh, we'll definitely, I'll definitely make that known. One thing about doing car shows is concept cars that pop out. And now this one wasn't at any of the concept shows. What you're seeing behind me here is the Kia. They've just come out with this teaser for a new sporty electric car ahead of the Geneva car show, which is coming up in March. It's an all electric concept kind of sports car um, that they're going to un unveil at that point in time. Um, you know, who knows? It may even be similar to the uh, to the Genesis uh, uh I forgot the name of it, <laughs> the Essentia concept that I showed in the last one, which is a pretty cool. So this this has a pretty nice look. It's the only picture out there. Um, you know, again, concept cars are, are, are just like their their the name assumes that they are you know design and, and architectural and technology and different elements that our manufacturers can put it into a vehicle to say this is where we're thinking we might be going with this. What do you think? How do you like it? This Some of this technology may end up in production. Some of these design features may end up in production. You can still grasp a lot from concept cars. Um, and, and I don't like it when people bash, oh, it's a concept car, so show me something that's real. Again, that's part of the process of bringing models to the market is you start from a concept, you go into a a more rounded and a more honed pre-production phase or prototype phase, alpha, beta, you know, certain types of prototypes, and then you get into pre-production. That's the, the chain of events that has to happen for auto manufacturers. So if we don't see concept cars, we're not, we're not in essence, seeing a lot of forward thinking, right? Uh, and that's the, the transition that, that most automakers take. So I, I love to see concept cars because it does give a good viewpoint of where, where the thought process and where auto manufacturers want to go, want to take their vehicles, what elements they want to look at bringing in and so forth. And it's a good opportunity for feedback. But uh, good to see Kia jump in the concept game as well. All right, finally, so before I end the show, one thing that I've talked about before um, when I've talked about the Audi e-tron, the Mercedes EQ 400, all these type of SUVs, you know, now the Honda, the Kona EV, the uh, Kia Nero EV, all these small to medium size SUVs that are coming to the market electrified. Why is so many SUVs coming, right? And, you know, why is Rivian coming out with a pickup truck and a uh, SUV, a big full size SUVs? Why didn't they just build four door? Focus, you know, and our Honda Civic size sedans that you can sell, you know, 20 million of these things worldwide. Why didn't they come out with that? Well, one of them is because that's the margin, right? The financial aspect of it is there's more margin in these kind of vehicles for companies to make more money. And no matter who the company is, even Tesla, they're not doing this for the good of their heart. Elon wants to, but you got to have money to do it. And if you're not making money at some point, you, you, you got to stop doing what you're doing because it just won't happen. 
everybody's in it to make money. Don't fool yourself, you know, that thinking that Elon is just doing it to save the planet. Yes, that's his, that's a, that's his goal, but he's also there to make money and to make the company money and to keep jobs and to do all this kind of good stuff. SUVs, compact SUVs, sport you know, crossover vehicles, they are a hot segment in, in many parts of the world, especially here in North America, as I mentioned, and in, in a lot of parts of Europe and, and, and other areas. So why I bring this up is because I recently, after I came back from the Canadian Auto Show, I got my local paper here, and you, and you might not be able to see some of this on camera. I'm going to try to do my best to keep a lot of this in camera here. But um, they, they, a lot of papers come out with segments. You know, you get your newspaper, and then you have a pullout segment that highlights a car show or, or automobile section or buy and sell or whatever the case may be. This local paper has a section called motoring, and it's it's a feature all about cars, and it comes out once a week or once every couple of weeks. And this one happens to be referencing the currently ongoing Toronto Auto Show, Canadian International Auto Show, which is uh, by the logo, and to find your passion as a logo and so forth. So all I want to point out here is is what, what I see when I open up this, uh, this newspaper. So on the front, we have a, a really high-end car. I don't even know what it is, but it's in one of the exotics that they brought in. So here we have, on the first page, we have Lincoln SUVs. Here we have SUV, SUV, we have full-size sedan, and we have a station wagon. These are Volvos, so they're one of the few that still have station wagons out there. I love station wagons, by the way. They're really great cars. Next page, F-150 pickup truck, GM ad with pickup trucks, pickup truck, Ranger, Ford, pickup trucks, and an SUV. Okay. Next page, I open this thing up. Uh, I got an ad about tires. That's great, but winter tires. We get the Honda Passport, which is an SUV, and we got the Dodge Ram, all Dodge stuff, SUVs. Next page. Oh, we've got an ad for the auto show showing an exotic car, something that uh, the Devil 16, which I'll never ever afford or care about really. So they have a write-up about that. Oh, and look, they have a write-up about pickup trucks in here as well from Ford. Isn't that interesting? Next page. Oh, we've got a Mazda 3 sedan. Hmm, one of the few sedans in here. A Mazda ad showing both their SUVs and uh, actually three of their SUVs and one sedan in this uh, actually these are all compact SUV sorry Volkswagen sedan uh, Volkswagen Atlas SUV we've got the uh, Volkswagen Tiguan SUV and the Subaru Forester Forester which I guess isn't really an SUV maybe a crossover but it's a bigger vehicle next page we've got some sedan info from uh, Nissan with the Altima all-wheel drive the Hyundai Santa Fe and the Hyundai Tucson uh, SUVs or compact SUVs this page, RAV4, uh, Toyota Supra, fast car, okay, sports car, and the Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross, which is a small SUV. Hmm. Last page, Toyota, SUV, a couple of cars, pickup trucks. So are you getting my point, folks? L open up. I dare you to open up one of your, your car segments of, of your local newspapers and find less number of SUV and pickup truck uh, and crossover utility vehicle ads then then for small small to medium size sedan cars hatchbacks whatever two dollars this is the market and this is why people like Rivian are spending hundreds of millions into the billions now this is why Tesla after coming out with the Model Y and their pickup truck uh, aspirations and why they, they came out with the Model X and it's been as successful as it's been. That's the hot market. So that's why we're seeing um, this venture in for a lot of organizations, a lot of car companies into that marketplace. We are seeing some that are going against the grain. So guys like Sonos and others that are building smaller, more urban, compact cars to get into that mainstream for EVs that want to maybe don't need 500 kilometer ranges, maybe you can get away with a couple of hundred a day, but that get them in, into that urban transport mechanism. So that's the state of the market, folks. And I, I fully expect to see more SUVs, more pickups. I mean, there's all the talk about Ford and I talked on the last show about electrification there from some of them. I don't, I expect GM to, to get into the fold and, and, and I don't know about Chrysler, but uh, Chrysler has the minivan so that, you know, at least they have a plug-in hybrid minivan, which I think is a great vehicle. Um, so that's just the state of the market. I do expect more announcements to come out in that as time goes. And that's the reason is because that's the hot spot right now. And that's 
makes the money. Well, that's it for episode 32 of the EV Revolution show. Thanks very much for sticking through it and listening to some of my ramble on today's show. Um, I've been reading a lot of comments on YouTube and responding to forums and things like that, where I'm kind of answering similar questions and that a lot of it pertain to some of the subject matter here today. So I wanted to kind of go out of my bubble a little bit and address some of these from my personal viewpoint. Hopefully you found that beneficial. As always, I'd love to hear your comments. All my contact information is coming up at the end of this. And uh, along with thank yous for my Patreon. Thank you again, big heartfelt and end credits and so forth. One last thing, if you like the show, please subscribe. Uh, please send me comments and tell others about it. Um, I, I, ac I actually had somebody ask me the other day for some specs on my show. Um, so I was, I'm trying to get accredited media for some, some places and they wanted me to send information. And I haven't really looked at a lot of my specs, to be honest with you, because I'm just focusing on putting out some content, slipping it in between my real busy job and family life. And um, I'm very humbled by the by the number of likes that I have versus the number of, of dislikes. I mean, it, it, it's a 99% to 1% kind of, or even more than that. Uh, it's less than 1%. It's a very, very small number. And, and, and again, that kind of feedback is good for me to know that at least, you know, what I'm putting out, you guys are enjoying. You guys and girls are enjoying. So thank you very much for that. And I appreciate you if you spread spread the show around, tell people about the show to watch and subscribe and, uh, and send in uh, comments and viewpoints. And until next time, please, everybody stay safe. Uh, have a great week and uh, we'll see you next time when I see you.